Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pod's Sleep Stories. My name is Arif, and tonight I will be your guide as we embark on a journey to a land far, far away for a new perspective of your favorite childhood fairy tales. We will glide beneath the wings of dragons, sit at the edge of a crackling fireplace, and see if love's true kiss really does heal all. Before we begin, however, let us take a moment to relax and find peace and comfort in the place that we are in, here and now. Close your eyes and allow your body to relax into the surface beneath you. Here and now, you have no obligations, no responsibilities. By simply listening to the sound of my voice, you are already giving your body the great gift of rest. Anything else you are seeking will come in time. Unless you are seeking millions of dollars, or your own private island. I cannot promise that, as much as I would like to. But isn't a good story almost the same thing? Almost? Let us begin using our imagination together. What does your own private island look like? Are there golden sand beaches with turquoise waters lapping against the shore? Perhaps there is no cell phone service, no emails, no connection to the outside world, so you are left with nothing but the peaceful sound of waves brushing up on the sand. The rhythm of the ocean matches the rhythm of your breathing as you exhale and inhale. Exhale and inhale. Of course, there's also the unlimited food and snacks at the tiki bar too. At least, there is on my private island you should try it on your own. With your eyes still closed, turn your attention back to your steady breathing. Breathing is fairly important, after all, and paying attention to it can bring you closer and closer to dreamland, whatever that looks like for you. As you breathe in, Imagine the sunshine of your warm private island shining down on your skin. You can feel the toasty rays on your arms, your legs, your torso, and your face, soothing you. As you exhale, a gentle ocean breeze comes, whisking the heat away and leaving you in a state of perfect comfort. You breathe in, feeling the sun and warmth on your legs, your jaw, your face, your torso, even down, down, down to the ends of your fingertips. And then the wind slowly draws it away, bringing with it the dreamy aroma of the ocean and distant tropical beaches. You breathe in one more time, feeling that sun on your arms, your legs, your torso, your feet. Then, slowly, the breeze meanders its way toward you, whisking that heat away and leaving you in a place of perfect comfort and peace. Now that we have taken the time to relax and find peace and comfort 
in the place that we are in, here and now, let us journey to a land far, far, far away and see what magic, beauty, and lessons await us. This isn't your average fairy tale, after all. This is an incredibly boring fairy tale. Perhaps the most boring fairy tale that's ever existed. How interesting can a princess, a dragon, a prince, and a talking moon be? The moon is known for being a bit of a bore. Close your eyes, relax into the soft surface beneath you, and travel far, far away with me, to a land far, far away, just outside the capital city of Protagonistburg, not to be confused with Antagonistburg, which is across the bridge over the caverns of conflict, through the woods of whiny dialogue, and beneath the brambles of bland backstories. No, it is not in Antagonistburg where you will find the beginning of this story. It is not even Protagonistburg, which is a smidge too self-righteous and smells of likable underdog. Our story begins on the outskirts of Protagonistburg, where picturesque meadows stretch as far as the eye can see. Bunnies hop through the fields, pausing only to give passerby a darling look with sparkling eyes. It's a condition that is common among the bunnies in the land far, far away. No one is quite sure what makes their eyes sparkle, but they believe all bunnies seem to be afflicted with it. Occasionally, the sparkly-eyed bunnies will pause to nibble on a daisy that is perpetually in season before bounding between the wooden rungs of a fence where a nice shepherd surely lives. Perhaps there is even a beanstalk over there, perhaps even a giant one. But our story brings us past this meadow of sparkling-eyed bunnies. We travel beyond that, and even beyond the forest full of deer that seem to have caught a similar affliction. However, the birds and deer of the forest have an additional trait that many find rather strange. They have a habit of singing. They'll often make clothes for passerby, whether they like the clothes or not. They even take on the task of combing some people's hair as they gallantly ride through the forest on their noble steed. When the brave knights are wearing their armor, this is particularly challenging. But birds are much more resilient than one would think. One must have perfectly coiffed hair on the way to meet their beloved or fight their climatic battle after all. Beyond that, just before the swamp, a hut rests on the edge of the mud. Dried garlands of herbs and plants dangle from the rafters. Cats slink around the property, hissing at whoever dares to pass. And inside, a witch glares from the cracked window panes, biting chomps out of an apple that somehow never seems to grow smaller. She wears rags, clearly having never passed through the forest of the birds and deer. 
when nights pass by, she calls out to them, warning of the fate that awaits them. She warns them not to save the princess, but to leave her be. However, the knights do not listen. After all, why should they listen to an eternal lady at the edge of the swamp in a witch hat with an all-knowing crystal ball and an extensive collection of encyclopedias? It is beyond the field of sparkly-eyed bunnies, through the forest of glow-up birds, and around the witch's cabin that we find the woman that we will begin this story with. Naturally, she is not in a quaint little home by the water, where she sings about books with her father, who is an inventor. She is not riding down the river in a canoe, singing about the colors of the wind. She is not even caring for her brothers, who have been turned into bears. She is up in a tower. That's right, this is that kind of story. She is a damsel, and by all fairy tale accounts, she is a damsel in grave distress. The tower is but a pillar in the sky, so tall that no one could even dream of possibly climbing it themselves. Even if some brave knight could climb it, it would be nearly impossible to avoid the dragon that has its tail coiled around the base of the tower, where ivy flaps over its ancient scales. The dragon has green scales, but its red eyes are menacing, mean. When people look into them, they dream of nothing more than returning to the meadow of sparkly-eyed bunnies, where they can oo and ah in peace once more. But neither the dragon nor the tower stopped knights from trying, day in and day out. The maiden, the damsel at the top, Princess Blossom, spent most of her days watching knights be snapped at by the dragon, fall into puddles of mud, or never make it past the persistent birds putting bows in their hair. Some were too startled by the sight of satin, having never held anything but metal like their armor or their swords. But why were these knights trying so persistently? Maybe Princess Blossom had asked specifically for them to rescue her or join her company. Or perhaps Princess Blossom had offered them a large sum of money. Perhaps even her family had. It is a pity to spoil this for you, but none of those are the right answer. You see, the knights tried to reach Princess Blossom because they had heard that she was the fairest in all the land. Her parents, a king and queen, boasted about their beloved daughter's appearance, intelligence, and general princessness any time they got a chance. They thought it was a pity that the dragon and tower kept her separated from everyone. They wished someone could bring her down. So, nights tried for weeks, for months, as time chugged along, more and more knights began to try. Then came the fateful week. Four knights met at the edge of the meadow of sparkling bunnies. They sat with each other over a fire and agreed that one of them was going to be the heroes that rescued Princess Blossom 
from her lonely fate up in the tower. First, there was Knight Beneferd Braggart Boast. He was a handsome knight, by all accounts. He spent much of his upbringing causing noble women to faint when he winked at them, shooting arrows off of people's heads and kicking back a pint at the local tavern. Simply flexing his muscles could nearly cause an earthquake, so he had to be very careful with his biceps, as all real knights must be. Beneferd Braggart Boast had many suitors interested in him, but he couldn't pick any of them. No, he decided that he had to have the best of the best. He had to become engaged to Princess Blossom. He already knew so much about her that he had dreams about her nearly every night. She was beautiful. She was a princess. I mean, what more could a knight possibly want? She was perfect. Beneford wasn't about to let any of the other knights journey to Princess Blossom's tower before him. He couldn't risk anyone else reaching his beloved first. Especially since he knew he was the only one worthy of her love. So, as giving of a man as he was, he stepped forward with his sword and stood first, declaring that he was going to head off to collect his bride in order to save the others from the trouble. He was on his horse and riding through the lush meadow, before anyone else could react. Beneferd had his eye on the prize the moment his horse hit her stride. He could feel the wild wind blowing over his face, filling him with the sense of adventure and belonging. Wildflowers brushed over his handmade leather boots, sending up an aroma that would fill many with a flood of joy. But it was a bit too flowery for Beneford's taste. Riding confidently through fields towards the setting sun was what knights were best at. He didn't want to brag, but Beneford braggart boast was the best at riding into the setting sun. He was also the best at shooting arrows, winning over women, and slaying dragons. But that shouldn't come as a surprise. For some reason, the braggart boasts like to talk about how they are good at everything it appears that it must be some kind of family curse. Beneford rode through the fields of bunnies without a problem. They gazed up at him with their sparkly eyes, but he deflected them with the only defense he knew, his smile. He flashed that beaming smile at the bunnies causing them to fall back in surprise and cover their eyes from the blinding light of his white teeth. It's unknown how Beneford Braggart Boast had such fine teeth at a time without dentists, floss, or even toothpaste, but he would be the first to tell you that he had the finest teeth in all the land. Of course, after, he'd reassure you that he has an obligation to just be honest. Then, Beneford came to his second challenge, the forest of stylish birds. He could hear their breathtaking singing before he even reached the tree line. Overhead, 
willows, birch trees, oak trees, and maples swayed in the gentle breeze. Their green leaves flickered in the light of the sun, casting mesmerizing shadows on the forest floor. If you listened closely, you could even hear the gentle, bitter patter of the bird's feet as they flew and landed on branch after branch. They gathered, eager to see what Beneford was doing. He rode through the forest with a sweat on his brow. His massive muscles were tensed and ready for action, ready to meet his one true love. He paid no mind to the shadows on the forest floor, nor the beautiful call of the birds. He was already dreaming about the compliments his wife would be giving him soon enough. The birds floated down from the trees, sweet words tumbling from their beaks. They sang of the beauty of the world, the beauty of love and connection. They told Beneford that they were going to make him the best that he could be. Their voices were so sweet it could bring a tear to a statue's eye. And though Beneford had the personality of a statue, he apparently did not have a statue's eye because he was bone dry. The beautiful birds surrounded him. They carried the finest cloth that the land of the far, far away had ever seen. It shined in the light of the slowly setting sun, like each thread was made of gold or silver. Of course, Beneford knew he was a late autumn, so if they tried to put silver on him, he would protest. For you, brave knight, a chickadee chirped. It gracefully swooped down to Beneford with a cape in its beak, ready to wrap it around Beneford's shoulders. Beneford scoffed, and brushed the cape aside. I do not need your cape, bird. I have picked the perfect armor to meet my beloved. Just look at my muscles, Beneford scoffed. He flexed his muscles as he glided through the forest on the back of his horse. But the birds seemed unaffected. They shrugged their brightly colored wings at one another. I insist you try the cape, brave knight. We made it special just for you on your quest, a cardinal offered. It fluffed its red wings as it spoke, trying with all of its might to capture Beneford's attention. I need no help on my quest, Fowl. Surely you have heard of me, Beneford said. The birds had not, in fact, heard of him. Unfortunately, they were ashamed to say that now they had. For you, brave knight, a raven cawed, descending down with the cape once more. Beneford swatted at the bird, furious, but just the softness of the cloth caught on his rough skin. The stunning red fabric lifted into the fresh forest air, covering Beneford's eyes completely. He didn't see the giant sinkhole he was riding towards. Fortunately for his steed, the horse did and bucked Beneford off into the sinkhole just in time. Princess Blossom watched Beneford braggart boast 
fly through the air and land in the sinkhole from her bath up in the castle. She sipped on a homemade lemonade and paged through her book, humming a little tune to herself. Another night had been stopped by the birds. She sighed and sunk down deeper into the warm water. The lilac-scented bubbles filled her body with a sense of relief, but the hot water was like a balm for her tense muscles. She had spent many hours that morning playing the harp as she gazed out the window on the land far below. She certainly could use a massage, but she figured that for now, her bath would have to do. Back at the edge of the meadow, the three remaining knights exchanged glances with each other. They sat at the edge of a fire, waiting for Beneford to come back. But as his horse approached without Beneford on his back, they knew that Beneford hadn't made it to the beautiful Princess Blossom. Next, Montgomery Sharpchin decided it was time to try his hand at rescuing Princess Blossom from the tower. He brushed his hand over the soft hair of his horse's flank, promising the horse that there would be plenty of hay in her future. He made it through the meadow of bunnies and the forest of fashionable birds and deer with ease. When the raven placed a cape upon his shoulders, Montgomery accepted the cape with a smile. He flexed his muscles as he rode through telling the birds and deer that this is how a real man behaves on his way to save his beloved. Meanwhile, his beloved sat up in the tower, sipping her afternoon tea as she watched the sun make its way across the sky, painting it in all shades of orange, pink, and purple. As Montgomery neared the witch's cabin, he couldn't help but roll his eyes. What threat could a simple old lady possibly be to him, the manliest man on this side of the fantasy land? The witch hobbled onto her porch with a bowl of bubbling soup just before he rode by. She offered the soup to the knight, telling him it would give him power for the journey ahead. Montgomery turned his nose up at the foul-smelling soup. I have all the power I need. Look at me, he bellowed, flexing his muscles at the witch. She hardly blinked in response. The wind blew her slate hair across her unenthused expression. Once more, she lifted the fragrant stew up to Montgomery. In response, Montgomery knocked it from his hands and continued on. The witch shook her head and clicked her tongue. The boy doesn't have enough power to scare them off, she murmured to herself. Montgomery began to cross the swamp, the last obstacle between him and the dragon. But the moment his horse stepped foot in the swamp, a hungry alligator leapt from the water and swallowed Montgomery whole. It preferred a nice, subtle flavor to its humans. Back at the edge of the meadow, the next knight began his journey. Finnegan Fierceheart was perhaps the bravest, strongest, 
and fiercest of all the knights in the land of far, far away. He rode through the meadow and through the fashionable forest with ease. When he arrived at the witch's hut, he took a long draw of the stew she offered. It tasted of garlic and onions, so strong that it made Finnegan's eyes well with tears. As he began to make his way across the swamp, the hungry alligator rose up out of the water. At the mere smell of the garlic and onions wafting off of Finnegan Fierceheart's breath, the alligator's eyes began to water. He sank back under the water, disgusted with the power of Finnegan's stench. Finally, someone had made it. At the base of a tower, the dragon slept peacefully. Finnegan smiled to himself. It was a massive beast with scales that sparkled in the light of the setting sun. Little plumes of smoke escaped its lips with every audible snore from its lips. This was Finnegan's chance to slay the beast. He drew his sword with the powerful shing. As he raced toward the dragon, the dragon opened an eye. With ease, she lifted a claw, ending Finnegan's attack on her before it had even begun. At the top of the tower, Princess Blossom looked up from the art project she was working on. At the sight of Finnegan on the ground, she clicked her tongue, wondering when these strange men would ever learn. Back at the meadow, a final night sat by the crackling fire. His amber eyes traced the shape of the flames as he prepared himself for the journey ahead. His name was Noble Kind Man. To many, it was a mystery what kind of man he was. They truly had no way of knowing. He mounted his horse after carefully putting out the fire and rode toward the tower, singing a song to himself under his breath. As he passed the sparkle-eyed bunnies, he tossed small carrots down to them. The bunnies swarmed the carrots, their eyes sparkling brighter than ever. In the forest, he thanked the birds for their contribution as they adorned him with a homemade, well, nest-made cape. They even placed a flower crown atop his ginger locks as he waved goodbye to them. When Noble approached the witch's cabin, he asked her how she was doing. The witch was surprised. She told Noble about her day and even accepted his help, fixing the spookily creaky step at the bottom of her staircase. As a thank you, she offered Noble a bowl of stew. Truly, he hated onions, but he accepted with a smile and drank the stew anyway. He progressed through the swamp with ease. He waved at the alligator as it rose out of the water, its nose scrunched up in disgust. He called down to it, wishing it luck finding something else to eat. Then, Noble stood below the castle. The massive dragon coiled around the base, scowling at Noble with narrowed eyes. I apologize for bothering you, kind dragon. I've come to speak to Princess Blossom. Would that be okay with you? Noble asked 
giving the dragon a bow. The dragon smiled at Noble. Oh, you'll have to ask her. I'm just her downstairs neighbor. You wouldn't believe how many people try to just break in here. The dragon chimed nonchalantly. I'll leave you both to it. With that, the dragon that had terrified so many people moseyed off into the forest. Noble stood at the base of the tower, gazing up at it in wonder. He clutched his soft wool hat to his chest, calling up into the cool air. Princess Blossom, I am sorry for bothering you. I wanted to see if you'd like to join me for a walk in the forest this afternoon. My name is Noble Kindman. He heard his words echo back to him, sing-songy and inviting. Princess Blossom popped her head out of the top of the tower. Her long black hair cascaded out of the window, but she coiled it in, lock after lock, with a smile on her face. I would love to join you, Noble. I will be down in just a moment, she chimed. Just as she had promised, she was down in a moment. She descended down a hidden set of stairs in the tower and opened a door around the back of the building, stepping into the light for the first time in what felt like decades. Noble shook her hand with a smile. He motioned to the forest, inviting her to lead the way. How polite of you, she remarked. You wouldn't believe how many people try to bother me when I'm just trying to get some peace and quiet. That's why I moved out here in the first place. For the rest of the day, Noble and Princess Blossom sat by the edge of the river and chatted. Noble learned about her favorite color, her hobbies, her art. Meanwhile, Blossom learned about his hopes and dreams. They agreed to see each other the next day, the same time, the same place. I hope you have enjoyed this sleep story, and this has brought you a night of peaceful, relaxing sleep. I apologize if the story has bored you too much. Perhaps I will try to entertain you more next time. If you would like another story, be sure to check out the list of stories to soothe you to sleep. Until then, sweet dreams. I hope in our stories you can find your own impossibly tall tower, and that whatever night princess, or nondescript hero you have or will have in your life takes you for trips out of it when you wish. <laughs>